let's welcome our second panel, which is Increasing Prominence of Ecosystem and Sustainability in Corporate Boardrooms. I would like to call upon our moderator for this panel, Mr. Suhas Tuljapurkar, the founder and director of Legacy Services Private Limited and managing partner of Legacy Partners. Welcome, sir. Now, I would like to introduce and call all the panelists and would request them to enlighten us with their views. Our first panelist is Mr. Shankar Jadha, the managing director of BAC Investments and chief strategy officer at BAC. Sir has also been an advisor and mentor for various businesses. He has been recognized as the top 100 influencers in finance. Welcome, sir. Our second panelist, Mr. Manoj Mathur, the director at Solar Energy Corporation of India. Sir has an experience of more than 33 years in NTPC, a leading utility in power sector. Also, Puzzles over 14 years of experience in contracting and procurement activities. Welcome, sir. A third panelist, Mr. Aviram Rosen, the founder and international director of Sadna Forest, a vegan volunteer-based organization focused on creating long-term plant-based food security through environmental restoration. Sir is also a member of the Global Restoration Council and a board member of the Foundation of the World Education. Mr. Aviram has always been an inspiration for their dedication to veganism and their low carbon footprint lifestyle. Welcome, sir. Our fourth, our fourth panelist, Dr. Mukund Rajan, the chairman of EQ Investment Advisors Private Limited, which focuses on environmental, social, and governance issues in India. Sir has also an experience of over 23 years with Tata Group. Dr. Rajan also serves as the chairperson of the Environment Committee of the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry. As well as Dr. Rajan has received the award of Young Global Leader by World Economic Forum in 2007. Welcome, sir. Now, I would like to request Mr. Sohas to take the discussion forward. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Harsha. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. Okay, thanks, thanks. Thanks, Arsha. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us today on the World Environment Day. Uh, I think we're missing Mr. Manoj Mathur because he's had some medical emergency. Uh, uh, so I think, therefore, it is uh, on our shoulders here today. Uh, Mr. Shankar Zadha, Mr. Aviram Rosin, and, uh, and Dr. Mukund Rajan. Thank you very much for joining us on the panel today. Uh, I want to keep it as an informal discussion. We'll start off with, with some of the kind of uh, issues that are probably bothering me today. I wouldn't say that, you know, uh, I, I, I can't uh, say I'm a spokesperson on behalf of environmentalist group or on behalf of government, on behalf of boards, uh, on behalf of corporates. But I think we have such a varied panel where I think, uh, you know, Mr. Shankar Zadav is from Bombay Stock Exchange and actually looking at how uh, sustainability reporting happens with various listed entities. Whereas Mr. Aviram is actually a man on the ground who, who just creates forests for all of us. Thank you very much, Aviram, for your dedicated kind of work in this space. And we have Dr. Mukund Rajan, who has had tremendous experience, not only at the local level, but at the global level, and then moved on to set up an environment-related fund. So I think we have, we have the kind of diversity and variety today to look at what are the issues that are there. And I'm going to, I'm going to put the context uh, in view of the theme that we have for the World Environment Day today, which is actually just say that UNEP came out with this reimagine, recreate, and restore. And I think we've been hearing about the reads, whether it is right from repairs to um, restructuring to reimagine in every sector during COVID and during the latter part of the COVID. Um, so the context is actually, you know, post-COVID. And during COVID period, I think the world will... And the, and the history will be divided pre-COVID and post-COVID. 
so during covid we realized that the earth bounced back bounced back in shortest possible time we had cleaner airs we had cleaner rivers we had we could see mountains from distances we could see uh, oceans from distances we had the bouncing back of the earth was actually one of the learnings that it, it recreated itself it got into repair mode very soon and and i think if its use or abuse uh, you know was controlled or regulated it came back and it showed us phenomenally how the green gas emissions came down you know the yesterday's oecd kind of a paper on on this theme to therefore kind of looks at one critical area is when the economies are now turning around and they're bound to turn around whether we have second wave in india or not i think the economies will turn around and the economic growth will be will be something different from what we have experienced till now when this happens i think the agenda about you know recreating and restoration with responsibility how is that going to shape up and how will that be looked at and what are the issues around it it's something which i would like to request each one of you uh, as opening remarks and i'm going to i'm going to start off with dr mukund rajin uh, thank you very much sir thanks for joining and i think with your kind of experience i wanted to touch base this and set the tone in this context over to you thank thank you so much suhas um so i think you you hit the nail on the head with uh, the suggestion that there is a pre covid and a post covid sense of uh, you know human kind's place in, in in the world in the the universe uh, i think what is true is that we have been seeing growing awareness in recent years of the importance of the natural environment uh, and the role that well functioning ecosystems can play in supporting economic growth and there has been also growing awareness of the complex interface with human society and the role of markets in influencing uh, i have to say more often than not negatively uh, these ecosystems but as you quite rightly pointed out i think what covid has done uh, it's played its part over the last year in reminding all of us of the importance of ecosystems in the natural environment uh, the very rich biodiversity all around us Uh, you have stories of people who during lockdown for the first time perhaps realized that they're living in the midst of a rich bird life uh, and started to notice the bird calls in the morning uh, or as you rightly mentioned people in the north uh, in the plains perhaps who for the first time started seeing the himalayan mountain ranges through clear and unpolluted skies but i think perhaps the greatest change uh, in recent years has been the attention that has uh, focused on the issue of global warming and climate change which uh, the un has of course described as an existential crisis for all of us so there is clearly greater sensitivity uh, amongst very varied stakeholders on the issue of human kind's impact on the environment and the fact that much of the adverse impact uh, is unfortunately led by economic activity which the corporate sector is steering Uh, there's also knowledge that the risks to the sustainability of businesses are increasing uh, this can undermine economic growth and job creation in the future also at the same time there are new opportunities that are emerging for businesses uh, a great case in point is obviously what's happening in the whole renewable energy space so you are seeing multiple stakeholders who are now calling out businesses or cautioning corporates about the responsibilities for ecosystem protection uh, these include millennials who truly worry about the legacy that this generation is leaving them non profits regulators government lenders and investors and on this last category of investors i think it's worth mentioning that today asset managers controlling over 100 trillion dollars of funds have subscribed to the unpri for the principles for responsible investment which emphasize esg or environment social and governance considerations in the way in which they evaluate investment opportunities and in fact esg investing is now the fastest growing asset class so for boards corporate boards which is the theme for our discussion today the sustainability agenda 
is now obviously a very major issue. Uh, and so as you understand this, I think better than any of us, boards have a fiduciary responsibility to all of these stakeholders. They have a duty of care. They need to understand the risks and opportunities from a sustainability and ESG perspective. And they need to ensure the long-term success of their businesses and protect their reputations. Uh, you're already seeing, I think just last week with some of the oil firms, for instance, that boards are being hauled before courts for failing to take these responsibilities seriously. So it is an integral part of every board's responsibility to exercise oversight of the company's strategy, ensure the business is undertaken in accordance with the stated mission, vision, and values. And since this impacts multiple stakeholders, there is an obligation on the board to balance the interests of all of these stakeholders. Uh, and this, I think, is, is really the reason why today this subject is now, I think, a major, major board priority across the world and increasingly uh, in India. Uh, let me stop there, Suhas, with those opening thoughts. No, no, thank you very much for those remarks. And I think we will come back to on the fiduciary responsibility, uh, you know, both ways, uh, you see, as directors and as kind of citizens, you know. Uh, but I'm going, to, I'm going to request Mr. Aviram Rosin for, uh, you know, uh, Aviram ji, from the point of view of expectations of the not-for-profits, because I think when we're when we talking about resilience recovery today, we are going to talk about a very, very uh, speedy recovery. We are going to talk about a growth which probably the world has never seen. Uh, and in that zeal, how, how does not-for-profit expect from corporates what it needs to do on being responsible? And what your experiences have so far been and what do you see in future uh, as expectations from the not for profit, which is one of the stakeholders which kind of champions the cause of citizens at large. So over to you, Mr. Roth. Yeah, thank you very much for this opportunity to, to share. Um, I think the, the problem starts with the different uh, points of view of the corporates and the NGOs. I mean, the, the non-for-profits are in the field and they see the people suffering uh, from um, you know, climate change, they see this happening and uh, they see also nature suffering very much. And the corporates are um, you know, more in the cities, in the major cities, in the corporate offices, they uh, less have this sense of urgency. And um, I think the sense of urgency is the, is the main difference between the corporations and the NGOs. We feel that it's going to hap it's happening now and it's going to collapse very soon. And people in the corporate world feel, oh, there's enough time. We'll change a little bit and, uh, you, you know, we'll define goals for a very long term. And, and, they, and I think that if we meet more like we're doing today, uh, I think it's very valuable, uh, this meeting, and, and I think there should be more of this, and maybe legacies could play a, a, a leading role in introducing the nonprofit and the um, profit <laughs> worlds together. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, that would be a beautiful contribution to India, I think, and, and then we could uh, hopefully um, pass this sense of urgency to the corporate world. And once this sense of urgency uh, is there and people uh, understand the, the ground reality, there is a, uh, a, the qu next question um, is what we can do together, how we can support each other. And um, we can definitely support with insights from the ground. I think the corporates could support with a lot of skills, with a lot of people, with a lot of funding. And together we can do something very valuable the, the, the limitation of the, um, this liaison is that uh, usually the corporates we meet with the huge NGOs, right? Because they are, their headquarters is closed in Mumbai or Delhi or the major metros. <laughs> uh, they know them from social media. Uh, um, so the, the grassroots NGOs, which are much more cost effective in terms of less management and overheads and are doing much more uh, um, you know, work in the ground are less funded. And that's again a, a question of disconnect that has to be bridged by someone. 
that would, or by, by maybe by legacies that would bring people together from the small grassroots NGOs that have, you know, one or two or three percent of management and overheads, <laughs> um, and and the big corporations, um, and enable us to work together. And I, I really hope that this will happen because I think that our reality would be very tough if we, if it doesn't. Yeah. No, sure. Thank you. Uh, thank. Uh, thanks for that, uh, you know, articulation, uh, Aviramji. I'm going to, uh, on that note, as to you know what one can do in in order to kind of create a platform or create an ecosystem. I think I must say that you know Bombay Stock Exchange has been doing a phenomenal job, and I'm going to request uh, Shankar Zado for his initial comments on. Uh, you know, how do we, it's, it's not about regulations, you know, regulations we've been talking about, legislative changes we've been talking about, which is to push to say that environment compliances have to be done correctly, which is the bare minimum threshold probably that is non-negotiable. But when, when BSC sets up a platform, which is actually, you know, trying to look at CSR funds and trying to look at responsible not-for-profits coming together to work, as Aviram, you said, in terms of for-profit uh, there to kind of collaborate together. I think that's one area. And I'm going to request uh, Shankarji for his comments on overall, you have experienced this at, at the stock exchange, that how are the companies responding to this clarion call when I think uh, the world recognizes climate change as the biggest risk factor. And it's also, uh, the, from a point of view of understanding that risk correctly, how are the corporates responding? While it, it transgresses into sustainability for sure in future. Over to you, Shankar. Thank you, Suhas. Uh, it was good to hear Mukund and Aviram. And uh, let me tell you, we, BA, we at BAC have been part of... Uh, social responsibility, sustainability for over a long time. We were Asia's first sustainability exchange. We started the GreenX and CarbonX more than a decade back. Uh, we have lots of funds, which are green funds, which come into our not only normal exchange, but even the international exchange. People are responding well because it's all financially tied. But as uh, Aviram pointed out, when we look at from, uh, profits and not-for-profits coming together, it's a difficult task. And I can see some things which uh, hamper this coming together. One is, as uh, earlier Dr. Amita had pointed out, that uh, people don't see long term. You know, in uh, corporates, we have that quarterly results and uh, how much has a CEO made a difference to the co corporate over a short time. You know, everyone has a <laughs> tenure. So they all have short term visions. So what we need is the board altogether rather than a CEO or MD to be responsible. Because the board directors don't change often. So we've been part of the global reporting initiative. What we've noticed is what you don't measure, people don't care for it. So our regulators, SEBI, has been really great at it. It has been trying to understand what's happening and have been doing it. In fact, they started business reporting, BRR, has to be compulsory, made every year and published and it should be in public domain. It's a very good initiative. They've also changed the structure now to include more and more details. Sure. And that's also a good approach. I've noticed that SEBI, since its beginning, has always started small, done pilots, seen tests, learned from it, and gone ahead. So I think this initiative also will go ahead. But there are certain pointers that, as what I have seen, that we can change. One is this being transparent on the use of funds. In India, there is a culture. Where, you know, you say, okay, this is a private fund, this is CSR money, this is this. We don't want to tell people what we have done with it. I don't know what's the harm in telling people what to do with it, even if it's private or whatever. We have to have this nat natural way of telling people that this is what we have used the money for. The second part is environmental or sustainability thing actually works when everyone takes responsibility. It's like, you know, everyone obeys the signal rules on roads. If everyone stops at red and goes at green, then there are very, very few accidents and things happen well. But when someone breaks the rule, the other guys see it. And if there's no punishment, if there's no consequences, they say, why should I take extra effort to follow the rules? So the same thing happens in such things. Like we have two indexes, like carbon X and green X and all. 
it is very difficult to you know pamper companies and ask them yes you join you do your initiatives and let us know we will advertise for you that you are doing good because customers today uh, the investors today almost all stakeholders are ready to pay a price for sustainability and managing ecosystem well uh, this initiative has to be taken third thing is we are too fragmented you know with the csr rule for instance compulsory csr the rules is like too small 2% of anyone having a profit over 5 crores i think it's too small an amount of money it has to be pooled together there has to be a sustainable level when the funds come together that also increases one thing when you know people pool the money and make a little larger fund that transparency of it comes if it is within an corporate to decide what to do with it it's a difficult thing one more thing that regulators have to do it is they have clubbed together sustainability with things like you know education with things like emergency things like covid that diverts the funds because we are always going from one emergency to another and we will never look at sustainability over long term or climate change we have to earmark for it's like you know my children's education takes precedence over whatever short term issues i have with debt or money or whatever we have to do it and uh, when people see for profits for uh, for profits see that there is huge amounts of funds collected in the name of green funds there is an estimate that by 2025 we may see uh, globally around 50 trillion dollars coming into green funds if that is the kind of investment that's going to come i am sure that global partners will look at it and one more thing that will affect this whole thing is as companies corpora globalize as they become larger they are questioned more often they are held more responsible the directors have more fiduciary responsibility they cannot get out of this uh, sustainability system whereas when things are small which is often the case in developing economies like ours we have msmes which are largely uh, not really above a certain grade so you can't really expect large sustainability funds coming from them or actually being used properly so these are a few things i think i will open with and maybe the panelists can take it ahead thank you no no thanks a lot uh, shankar ji i'm i uh, please stay with me for a while i mean i i want to i want to kind of uh, understand uh, slightly better in terms of the experiences on what you talked about business responsibility and sustainability reporting that's now made mandatory by uh, sebi is it a matter to be regulated like the csr csr probably you know one can always argue whether it is a matter to be regulated or not is sustainability a matter to be regulated because it is virtually a non negotiable issue at least in terms of environment protection maintenance preservation and it does make business sense sir in the social economics there is a concept of specific reciprocity versus general reciprocity you can't expect everyone to be going by the same ethics that they will do something on their own it's like you have 10 children or five children or two children do you think both of them will take sports as seriously as what the other takes or education or for that matter the way they speak the way anything that they do so i believe you require to have some regulation and it's been known that when some things don't add, add to your bottom line corporates shy away from doing it it's like the priority goes down do i would not say that they ignore it completely <laughs> i'll give an example how many boards today really look at sustainability as a big thing you uh, there is a study done by when uh, it's a very small study because during the corona times what has happened is uh, we have found that the meetings committee meetings uh, are recorded so the time recorded for say csr committee meetings or such are almost insignificant as compared to say the main board meetings or renumeration committee meetings or such so you can see the priority accorded i believe like the western world has started we require to have a director level responsibility and ask him to speak about it the more people speak about it the more they know it is important you know people talk about profits and the balance sheet so much that i hear 99% of the time they say okay we'll listen to you but let us listen to this first and uh, i am talking about this as an experience with various boards in listed and non listed sphere i believe it has to be regulated i'll give an example uh, in automobile sector functions and everyone know in the world knows automobile sector well are you aware how many accidents occur in this sector 
you will get some numbers. I don't believe those numbers. We at I am from I am Ahmedabad, and we formed a group. We said, okay, let's study this. So there is a safe in India. So we studied it, and we've seen underreporting. Like you know, world over, there is underreporting of various such negative consequences or negative uh, facts. But there is underreporting, and that underreporting is because there are consequences, both financial and non-financial. So companies tend to hide it. How do they hide it? Some of the things which are easier, especially in India, you will see that a project which was done by the employees, there was the cost X. You know, had X employees, Y number of man hours that they used, and Z amount of equipment they used, and the total came to this. Now, when you give it to a on basis of contract, like for instance, say a solid waste collection, when you give it on contract, how can the cost come down, sir? The contractor adds his administration costs. The cost cannot come down, but that is the way even the government behaves. And when we talk about sustainability, let me tell you: bottom of the pyramid, employees or contract workers or those who are unemployed, they'll work even for free because they require experience. So in India, with such a high amount of people coming out of uh, the colleges every year, we add up to almost one population of Australia every year to the employability pool. I think it's a big. uh drought and we have to have that regulation the details when a regulator asks you cannot tell uh give wrong data and it has to be like in the case of sexual harassment for instance after the supreme court judgment it has been taken seriously and i believe it has had very very good consequences similarly in the sustainability system we should have regulation that regulation should give high priority to sustainability and the way we look at it i think it will work what you measure is what you get otherwise you don't get swas that is the first thing <laughs> the <laughs> other thing that thank you is, no i will also add one more point what people do is low hanging fruits if something like for instance in the schedule that is given for csr they will take the easiest what is the easiest financial inclusion education or give money for some people local area for the school sub project those kind of things really don't give sustainability i also seen one more thing about arman sustainable uh, you know followers what they think you know donating trees or plants and saplings really make an effort no what is the problem with uh, foresting or uh, enforcement the biggest problem is who will give the land if it's government land if i put uh, uh, trees on it they would not appreciate and i would find it difficult if it's my private land why would i waste valuable land in foresting it so there are huge issues in terms of land especially in mumbai for instance there is also a question if the tree is not properly uh, sustained they normally fall and you will see concretization everywhere people don't like mud because of various issues with it these urban issues india is going to urbanize rapidly in fact it's already urbanized in fact around 20 years ago i was going to do a phd on how urbanization will happen in india it didn't go off but urbanization definitely did go up <laughs> as urban grows people think that only cars pollute the environment no what you talked about cleaner environment it is because of the real estate developments continuously in the sky you will see particulate matter floating around because you are building tall 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 buildings so real estate if you shut down for two months you will see that it will be cleaner rather than the vehicles but the issue is can we stop de- development for sustainability and for developing countries that's a bigger issue like we also have a population so people talk about per capita stuff when you talk of per capita it's the rich people who actually exploit the poor people's numbers to show that we are better off <laughs> so you know india is very uh, putting lots of money but if you look at per capita it's not adequate so we have to look at these issues thank you suhas for giving me some no, no, thanks thanks thank thanks a lot uh, it's a very interesting points that you made and i'm going to i'm going to move to dr mukund rajan uh, sir i think at the board level today whenever we we look at the board composition and a very interesting point that shankar ji made was actually to say that on the remuneration of uh, of uh, ceo and executives uh, you will spend enough amount of time but on the critical areas such as environment and ecosystem the board doesn't have too much of time to kind of spend while one can understand why it is happening in that manner uh, however uh, you know one of the issues is that 
at the board level today in india and i'm looking at indian companies typical on an average board compositions is there enough capacity to understand at least and be aware of the issues i mean in earlier panel when we when we talked about dr apte actually alluded to say that you need a complete scientific approach uh, to whatever decisions that you are taking at all levels uh, and i'm saying uh, is there enough capacity at an average board level i mean i can understand top of the companies who are very sensitive would probably look at engaging somebody on the esg committee if there is an independent esg committee mandated by now to the international stock exchanges and nysc and nasdaq is pushing that agenda and making sure that there is esg committee so on the esg committee today you probably have one of the independent directors but is there enough capacity is there enough competence is there enough understanding and awareness at the board level was been uh, so how so said i'd say it's uh, <clears throat> in a sense uh, horses for courses uh, there are companies and industries that are uh, creating a huge impact on the environment or indeed do a lot of sourcing from the natural environment and where you need much more capacity or capabilities at the board level when some of these discussions take place but there could be many other companies in the services sector for instance in IT for instance where perhaps it is not the most critical element that impacts uh, the company's own fortunes and where with a certain amount of basic information awareness building the board even without specific experts can get by quite well uh, many boards also as you rightly mentioned you know you can always bring in experts and counselors you can create advisory bodies and of course you will be relying quite a lot on the management itself and you obviously should worry if the management does not have that capacity or capability but within the board it is not necessary in my opinion for there to be extreme specialization on all of these subjects necessarily i think it a lot of it depends on which industry you are in so if you are an oil company for instance and a lot of your investment in the future could potentially become stranded assets you obviously want somebody who's got a strong perspective on where the industry is moving what are the new technologies what's happening in carbon capture and storage things of that nature you can guide the rest of the board with a little bit more expertise but i don't think you necessarily need an expert as long as you have other devices to be able to get hold of the knowledge but linked to that is this other question which often comes up to at least create attention in the board on the issue and once the board directors are suitably sensitized and they want to have more discussions they may themselves uh determine that there is a need for greater expertise maybe members of the nomination remuneration committee will then uh, identify a profile that is important to be inducted onto the board because they can see that there is a gap now how do you create that discussion now one very good example i think in india is what happened with the csr legislation by dint of creating a csr committee of the board and insisting that it had to have at least one independent director as a member i think you elevated the discussion in corporate india about csr and suddenly the board started understanding that this is interesting this has impact you're starting to become very curious about where your funds are being deployed what the outcome is there's also an obligation now to report it so there's a reputational consequence if you don't report it well and so on and so forth likewise i think taking that analogy there perhaps is a space in the initial period when you're trying to create more awareness and understanding in the boards to try and mandate perhaps a committee of the board that looks at this issue in its totality now one of the suggestions in fact in the tata group which we took on was in some companies they actually converted the csr committee into a csr and sustainability committee now it is entirely within sebi's remit for instance to mandate that going forward perhaps you want to have an esg committee of the board that will oversee all of these issues sustainability and csr uh now some companies do it today in some respects the risk committee will look at sustainability risks the audit committee may also look at some of the sustainability issues but perhaps to create a focus for the next few years particularly in lockstep with this new mandate about creating the business responsibility and sustainability reports it might be worthwhile to actually 
explicitly demand that these boards create a committee which has the responsibility. And perhaps after four or five years, when a lot of this discussion has been fairly well understood and internalized, and directors have built the capacity, you could even say that no longer is this committee a mandatory committee. Boards that choose to have it can keep it. Those that want to dispense can uh, do away with it. Because by then you're confident that at the level of the board broadly, these issues are coming up again and again and getting adequately addressed. So that, that would be the way I would probably think about the way you create a focus. And I don't think every board, just because sustainability is, a, is an issue, should necessarily have one person who has purely sustainability linked expertise. You have very, very capable directors who have a broad range of interests, many of whom have had previous industry experience uh, from the independent director quota, who would do a pretty good job. Uh, so I, I think you'll have to look at it case by case. No, no, sure. Thank you. Thank you for that. I think uh, I'm going to move to uh, Mr. Aviramji. And I think, uh, sir, what I'm going to look at is when we try to build these capacities in the corporate sector, which is to kind of understand the environmental issues. I mean, at the management level, at the board level, uh, at all stakeholders level, through probably what you alluded in your opening remarks as a collective action program. You see, what could be the agenda for not-for-profits or other stakeholders, other than, let's say, the management and the, and the corporates themselves or the shareholders of the corporate themselves? What could be the agenda as we move forward when I think in the zeal to grow and come out from COVID uh, in a downturn, everybody is going to latch on to every opportunity. They would want to use, abuse all the resources that are available and try to grow try to maximize their profit, try to kind of recoup themselves on the economic loss that they have experienced in past couple of years. At that point in time, what would be the agenda? Aviram, for you. Yeah. Uh, are you asking what would be the agenda of the NGOs, uh, that the NGOs would be sort of pushing forward? That's right. And, and, and as a collective action program, Okay. Um, I think the first thing is dialogue. As I said, the first thing is to create a very close dialogue between board of directors of NGOs and board of directors of the corporations. Um, I, I think that the, the NGOs can contribute to the uh, overall program, to the overall plan, the, the long-term aspect, because we, uh, many of us, think very, very long-term. And uh, in a discussion with the board of the, uh, I'm next CEO, so I know both sides. Uh, um, you know, if, if, you, if you enter a discussion between a corporation and an NGO, we are talking about 20, 30 years, and they're talking about, uh, you know, the next quarter. And then we, we end up talking about five, 10 years, you know. <laughs> we, we, we sort of meet in the middle. And, 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 and that's good. I think that's refreshing for them and also refreshing for us to, to see under what pressure they're acting all the time. Uh, uh, so, but as you said, the board is better positioned to uh, engage in this program than the uh, management, uh, uh, the CEO, because uh, um, the, the time spans that the uh, directors are thinking about is, is longer. Uh, so, um, yeah, I think a, a dialogue towards a, a long-term program that would uh, enable to utilize effectively the uh, abilities of the corporations to uh, uh, make a change and to bring science uh, into this. To The NGOs have another aspect that they're connected to universities. For instance, we in South the Forest work very closely with some of the leading uh, universities in the world in our field uh, and in carbon sequestration. And so, so we could also... Uh, connect the scientific world, the scientific environmental world with the corporate world and uh, hopefully encourage them to support activities that are more science-based. Um, uh, uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, there are uh, oxalogenic trees. Oxalogenic trees are trees that sequester carbon in the soil in the form of calcium carbonate, limestone. Okay, so this is permanent sequestration. If you, even if you burn the tree, 
or you cut the tree, the uh, carbon will not be released back to the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. I don't think any board uh, in India uh, knows that there is an option to do permanent sequestration of carbon in the soil. So they know about planting trees, but they don't know which trees. But uh, this uh, issue of oxalogenesis is researched by, by uh, the academic world for more than 20 years. And we are working with the academic world all the time in India, testing the soil for uh, this kind of um, permanent carbon sequestration and proving that it exists here with local bacteria and fungi and so on. So uh, we could contribute in that sense as well to make a science-based uh, overall program. Sure. No, no, thanks. Thanks for that example. I think it actually kind of opens up lots of, uh, you know, eyes and it uh, it kind of wakes up people to say that, yes, if you have a scientific approach, I think that the world would be different. But stay with me on one issue uh, towards that is when we start now talking about, let's say, fossil fuel, when we start talking about uh, green gas emissions and uh, when we when we talk Talk about all these things, I think there does appear to be a ray of hope when we talk about circular economy, when we talk about how do we reuse everything uh, from the circularity perspective. And it does make a business sense for every business to look at circularity rather than being linear in its approach. So, you know, when we are talking about, you know, recreate or restore today on, on the world environment day i think the circularity to me is is not a negotiating point in a sense there are no two sides to circularity one of course it's circular and therefore there are no two sides second i think there is no pro or con about circularity everybody understands and agrees that if we embrace circularity today i think the things would be economically benefit for the organizations for profit there is no question about it it also saves the ecosystem and environment because of the manner in which the entire circularity gets uh, defined and gets gets down to the micro level. And therefore, to that effect, it also helps not-for-profits and all others who are passionate about uh, environment and ecosystem. So if we look at circularity and if we look at it from that point of view that how do we propagate circularity today? Um, you know, what would be your views? Because you are into, let's say, you, you're creating forests for all of us. And when we talk about circularity, how does that get translated into a business case? Let's understand, to be sold across to the board. So uh, I'm not sure what you mean by circularity in this context. Could you clarify a little bit? Okay, so for example, whenever we are talking about, let's let's understand a product being manufactured. If all the materials, the raw materials and intermediaries that are getting into that product are from the point of view of reusability tasted again and again. You see, then what happens is that when the product life cycle ends, you are bringing back the waste into the same mainstream to manufacture further products. That, that world is moving from linearity to circularity on, on almost every product that we take. So it's a sensible use of minerals. It's sensible use of all the materials that we're using. You know, just to kind of give an example in Indian context, I think when we were, uh, we were children, I think our grandfather always taught us how to reuse any thread that you receive from anywhere. You see, how do you preserve it? How do you use it sometime back and you keep on reusing it? You see, that reusability, I'm just giving you an example where I think culturally India is very attuned to understanding that reusability because it also makes economic sense when your resources are, are sparse. So that circularity in every aspect of the business, if we look at it, I think that would that does make a business sense because it's it makes economic sense. It increases your profitability. It also makes you more responsible. You know, there is always resistance to change. Uh, people don't want to change. It's it's uh, the the famous saying is it's working and don't fix it, right? So so I I think that educating 
uh, you know, boards of companies on how important change is now is the main is the main challenge. I don't think there's a lack of um, knowledge in that sense of circularity. Uh, I think the knowledge exists uh, definitely here, as you say, because there is a, a attunement. Uh, uh, but Uh, I think that the people are not open to that because they have to change their model a little bit. They have maybe to change their supply chain a little bit and it's confusing for them and they don't want to do it because it might, in the next quarter or two, it might uh, uh, harm a little bit, so better not touch it. So I, I think in that sense, maybe what we need is role models, you know, uh, role model companies that would say, You, you know, um, like Warren Buffett with, did with uh, philanthropy, right? He said, we have all these billions, let's give most of them. And then so many billionaires have joined this. We need the Warren Buffett of circularity. Uh, okay. uh, um, uh, somebody that would, with, with, with uh, uh, very high stature in the, in the Indian business context that would say, I am moving into this and I'm leading the pack. I think... Um, I, again, I'm not very connected to the business world in India, uh, uh, but I, I feel that uh, this is maybe something that could work. Uh, and, and, sure. and a very concrete example that led to very high profitability could maybe uh, pull people towards this. No, no, thank you. Thank you for that. And, and Dr. Mukund Rajan, uh, your views on circularity and what's happening currently, plus what needs to be done? I, I think... Uh, It's, it's a space which is impacted by, I think, two slightly conflicting trends. <laughs> um, one is, you remember the old uh, term, planned obsolescence. <laughs> yes, Many yes. companies had a vested interest in creating products that would see end of life much earlier than, uh, than was necessary in order that they could then sell the next yes. iteration of the same product. That's how you would create sales growth. Right. Um, the, the problem is that you have a world of advertising which creates this hunger in consumers for more diverse products, the latest embellishments, uh, a few sort of additions here and there so that you can show off this product and say it's different from what anybody else has in the market. You see this happening all the time in the auto industry. You see this now with mobile phones. Uh, if somebody said, I'll sell you one mobile phone and you can use it for the next 25 years, uh, I'm not sure that people would necessarily <laughs> believe that it has all the right functionality. It'll have all the so-called cool uh, you know, systems, the touch screen and so on. So I think part of the problem is that human nature, consumers, and what advertising does to persuade you that you need something more, wow. you need to consume more, you need to consume differently is part of the problem. The good news, however, is I think there is much greater awareness that is building up much more information, but the cost at which all of this diversity and catering of demand is happening at. And so I think the clever companies, um, Aviram is just talking about role models, take a company like Unilever, which actually has taken a very forward looking stance and said, not only my, my own production, but all my supply chain has to fall in line with a certain set of parameters that will ensure my impact on the environment is minimal, uh, whether it is going to net carbon zero by the mid thirties or indeed my impact on forestry and so on. There, I think the advantage you get then is for an increasingly aware audience, you are seen as a, a role model, a front runner, and people start looking out searching for your products ahead of some of the others. You talked about repair of clothes and apparel. You're quite right. In India, this has been part of our culture. But there are companies like Patagonia that have made a big deal out of this. And I've got recognition for it. Uh, yeah. So I think it can work to your advantage in terms of brand equity. There are some thoughts that you should try and legislate this. That, however, I think is hugely problematic. There is, in fact, as we speak, some work that's happening in different circles trying to put out for the electronic space, for instance, how you could mandate circularity. And immediately the issues you run into is uh, what kind of lifespan you specify for different products? Uh, what kind of materials will you specify? What kind of sourcing and costing can you specify? And you suddenly move from a free market 
with a lot of market based indicators to a very controlled economy where everything is being mandated and prescribed that i think is the wrong direction to go in so i think you really go back to the issue of spreading awareness and then let market forces take over and give them a little bit of a nudge from time to time so they're doing the right thing but uh, i would uh, strongly counsel against trying to mandate circularity in any form or fashion uh, i think it's much more the job of the media the judiciary uh, public interest groups civil society to ask for products that are circular in the way in which they're produced well no, thank you very much i think we're running out of time i have been reminded that i need to expedite i'm going to i'm going to just ask uh, and starting with uh, mr shankar jadhav to mr aviram and to you dr rajan uh, i'm going to say that when we talk about this uh, in a theme today on world environment day what would be your one advice to the boards only one atom that if you want to put it as the front runner issue today for the boards uh, shankar ji i think uh, prioritizing and focusing on a few things will help us much more like for instance there has been a run up in the organization saying let's adopt a particular district and develop it let's adopt a particular forest part and let's develop it i think that focus will give a little uh, more amount of uh, understanding to corporates because they are used to you know non failure project if the failure projects fail they think it's wrong it was a wastage okay. of uh, funds which i think they should get up because lots of things you can't say failure and uh, in, india is a services country or rather you know that we gdp has a, a huge amount of services whereas the funds that come to for services are not really considered uh, transparent enough you know like for instance we have ngo people who travel around or help people that money they think it's a waste so we have to look at both the administrative sides of funding and non administrative side of funding with actual beneficial those things we have to educate like aviram and mukund both have said thank you thank you thank you shankar ji aviram uh, one thing i think you know i am i think uh, the the main thing for the board is to educate themselves to educate themselves by going to the ground even for a short visit to see where they are trying to help what they are trying to do to meet people to listen uh to be less disconnected i think would help them a lot to do the right thing and not to uh have the all the information mediated by experts and by this is good but also direct eyesight um would help a lot yeah thank you thank you everyone uh, dr raj so so has you know there's a saying that even a journey of 1000 miles starts with one small step i think the first step i would counsel any board to take is just call one meeting where the management will brief you on its strategy with regard to sustainability both in terms of risks and future opportunities i think that one session itself if it is a dedicated session it is not a paper meeting as shankar ji mentioned which lasts for 5 minutes but at least an hour hour and a half it will throw up so many possibilities and people will start understanding why it is important uh, to embrace the subject no no great great point because you're saying uh, let's put the esg on agenda item of the board and i have one meeting dedicated to it thank you very much for that uh, i'm i'm just going to conclude by saying see uh, at the beginning of my career bhopal gas tragedy happened and we thought probably the awareness was an important issue across corporate india and we said uh, it it's it it culminated into and it, as a consequence of bhopal gas tragedy there are a lot of legislative changes that came in including that a director ought to be an occupier in the factory subsequently it happened but predominantly i think the cause was bhopal gas tragedy and we thought that at some point in time we would stop talking about awareness and look at action points but unfortunately even today we are talking about awareness and we are talking about creating awareness and education about the critical issues on environment that's one very sad and sorry part of where we are today as the civil society uh, but i think on the fiduciary duty i think at the board level when we recognize that every director has a fiduciary duty and responsibility 
I think as a citizen, we also understand that we are in a fiduciary responsibility and duty. The earth, the nature that is given to us, we are here to use it responsibility so that for the next generation, we keep it uh, as intact as possible or improve it if possible. Um, therefore, I think the fiduciary duties that clash at the board level uh, you know, would want to make the directors more responsible towards use of resources, whether it is within the company or the larger resource size. Uh, but thank you very much, Dr. Rajan. Thanks a lot, Aviramji. Thank you very much, Shankarji, for participating and making this lively. Uh, can move on to uh, Harsha. If there are any questions, we can quickly take them. Yes, we have got lots of interesting questions on chat box, but we'll not take much questions. Uh, one question by Gaurav Joshi. Uh, what Aviramji now said about scientifically sequestering carbon through tree planting, if it can be done at a scale, can actually be a BSC listed company. What would be the three panelists say about that? Yeah, sure. Shankarji, you want to take that first? Yes, actually, a BSC listed company is something which has just grown to scale. Because before listing comes formation of the company, starting, making profits, making sustainable, and then listing. So listing will be at the largest scale. So I think what it requires is people to start something in this area. And as Mukund and Aviram both pointed out, there is very little knowledge and discussion floating around. Internet has got all the knowledge. But you know, it's like uh, someone mentioned that if wine was so really, uh, or alcohol was really so useful, then the bottle also would have danced, but it has to go into a human mind. I believe similarly, all this knowledge and wisdom has put to a human mind and they are dancing to the tunes. So listening may be last, but yes, we can support, we can have conversation. Uh, no, no, thank you. Thank you, Shankarji. Uh, because this is addressed to all three panelists. So, Mr. Aviram. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think that uh, uh, starting um, with dialogue, starting with a small uh, step and uh, learning about how that uh, tree planting works and, and understanding how to scale and where to scale in an effective way. There's always a temptation when people want to plant tree to plant very, very cheap. Uh, you know, and uh, then they discover that 90% of the trees have uh, died and they're, they're uh, you know, disappointed. Uh, but when you offer them uh, something more serious, more professional, more um, cared for, uh, then they say this is too expensive. So um, when you're talking about planting trees, uh, the, the question is whether you want to plant trees or you want to grow trees. It's two completely different things. And uh, there are very few organizations that are into growing trees very long term, and you have to sort of discern and find those, and then um, you know negotiate the prices. And yeah, so it's it's a it's a long it's a long way that starts with one small step. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rajan. Uh, really, nothing to add to what uh, Shankar and Avirama have said. The only Additional comment I would make is that increasingly from a climate change uh, addressal perspective, a lot of companies are looking for what you might describe as carbon offsets. So ways in which you can encourage this kind of activity to address issues in industry in hard to abate sectors like steel and cement where it may not be possible to eliminate carbon emissions entirely. And there I think there's a big discussion on the time frame in which you can grow some of this in order to adequately offset carbon emissions in a given period of time. So I think any idea that helps to, you know, put some of this vegetation up faster than uh, something which currently exists is most welcome. Obviously you have to test the ideas and show proof of concept, but I think it can be very, very worthwhile if it works out. Thank you, thank you very much. Harsha? Another, another small point, just that uh, I think that the, emphasis should be on planting indigenous forests, on planting indigenous plants. Okay, okay. Otherwise, you're going for very rapid growth and you're bringing all kinds of plants from Australia and Africa, and that's not good for this country in the long term. Yeah. 
very well said and excellent point there uh, harsha in fact and i mentioned uh, suhas because in this country i have seen i was on a government discussion and the highest level and you know they were thinking that if you plant so many number of trees it will benefit and i said it's not the number of trees it's the number of the green it's the coverage that you see from the leaf it doesn't matter if one tree gives you the whole coverage or number of trees they had a target of number of trees and that's where that's they were that's... having difficulty thank you no no thanks a lot excellent point again harsha yes there are other questions too but we'll take them uh, uh, offline because of time limitations now we'll quickly move forward to the next session thank you mr abiram thank you mr mukund thank you shankar sir thank you suhas sir thank you very much thank you.